About 50 years ago, a wrestler from Uttar Pradesh, Ahmad Raza, came to Delhi to build its roads. He told his daughter that a city makes a promise. Give yourself to me and your children will prosper. 50 years later, his daughter, Shazia Khan, has been shunted out of Delhi three times. She told a Tehelka reporter, my father used to say, Beta, I have built the roads of Delhi. But she now lives in a horrible, not even suburban cluster outside of Delhi called Bawana, beyond any civic amenities, 60 kilometers away from her workplace, and she's not part of the city that her father built. Today, we are here to discuss the politics of urbanization in India, what makes a good city. I think we are agreed on what ails Indian cities. All of us, whether we come from Chennai, Bangalore, Varanasi, Allahabad, Delhi, Bombay, would agree that one feels a sense of dismay when you live in a city. There is corruption, there is inequity, there is lack of aesthetics, there is breakdown of, of governance, and there is, in most of them, an absence of culture. We are agreed on what's wrong with cities. So today, we have a very eminent panel to describe what should be an ideal city. What is the city we should dream of? What are the solutions? And what, if at all, are there signs to be hopeful for? To discuss all of this, I take great pleasure in inviting the Maharashtra Chief Minister, Prithviraj Chavan. He is a particularly unique politician because people dislike him for being honest. When he came as Chief Minister of Maharashtra, within the first few months, he canceled 50,000 crores worth of projects that had been passed without transparent means. There are many other measures that he has taken. He is an uncomfortable political figure because people wonder how the system can be greased if you have an honest man in that crucial place. So Prithvi Raj Chavan, David Gensler, runs the biggest architect firm in the entire world, Gensler & Company. They practice in 150, 160 countries, most notably in China and, and several others. They have some business in India. And Katie Ravindran, who's been the head of, who is the head of School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi, runs, is part of the Delhi Urban Arts Commission uh, and is a very, very eminent planner and conservationist and somebody who thinks about the heritage of cities and how tradition and modernity can be married. So please join me in welcoming Prithviraj Chavan, David Gensler, and Katie Ravindran. Mr. Chavan, I'd, I'd like to start with you. As I said, we know what ails Indian cities. Perhaps it's better to paint the canvas again first of what is an ideal city, particularly for a country like India, if you were to start from scratch and build a city, or if you were to undo Bombay and do it again, what would be the ideal characteristics of a city? Well, let me confess at the outset that I've been involved with uh, urbanization, planning, and issues about uh, decisions about land use and all that for all of last two years. Um, I'm not a trained town planner, I'm not a trained architect also. I'm an engineer by training. But I was put in this chair exactly about two years back, and I decided to keep the urban development portfolio with me. And uh, over the last two years, it's been a very exciting journey, trying to grapple with the problems of a growing metropolis like Mumbai and a lesser degree, Thane, Pune, and Nagpur. And I honestly must confess, I only bring experience of Maharashtra. Uh, I have very little experience of what other cities have done. I've heard about it. I've, uh, presentations have been made. And I've interacted with academicians from Mumbai and uh, other areas. So I think, <clears throat> and I can only speak with the problems of Mumbai. So my remarks would uh, necessarily be restricted to what is my personal experience of Maharashtra, particularly Mumbai. We face a huge challenge of uh, urbanization. Uh, in Maharashtra, which is, uh, I always say, there are only 11 countries which have a larger population of state of Maharashtra. We would have been 12th had we been a country. We are the size of Mexico, larger than any European country. 
46% of the entire population of Maharashtra is today urban. A city of Mumbai and the metropolitan region around Mumbai is about uh, 19 million people. Uh, at last count, 2011. It acts as a huge magnet attracting people looking for employment opportunities. And there's a huge pressure on uh, civic communities, uh, housing, even drinking water, transportation. And therefore, the paradigm of uh, constructing townships in one location where it's possible and the paradigm of creating uh, industrial areas where it's possible and then making people commute and trying to build transportation infrastructure has been the model which we have followed. That has to change. There's a huge pressure in all our urban agglomerates, Pune, Nagpur, particularly Thane, of illegal construction, of trying to contain slumification and people migrating into the city. And uh, do you contain this pressure and make cities sustainable with uh, legal enforcement or trying to decongest cities by creating uh, new points, um, satellite townships and all that. These are the challenges that we face. Obviously, my ideal uh, city planning would be, or a metropolitan town would be, where people do not have to commute. That there are integrated uh, localities created where the economic opportunities exist side by side with social infrastructure and a decent dignified housing. That we have not been able to do. Um, if I can add a few words, pre-91 economic reforms, the government of India decided where a large mega project would come. It would necessarily come in a backward area and the township would get developed there. Post-91, we are left it to market forces. And then obviously market forces will go where maximum profits are there. And so time has come to uh, reorient our thinking. I think. And that's what I think we're all trying to do. Now, that's a really important point you've made, that earlier the whole idea of creating cities was that you would create new opportunities in other places. Today we have uh, agglomerations around just the same metropolises, which are already creaking uh, at the seams. Uh, so, Katie, I'd like to come to you. You speak a lot about humanizing cities. You know, uh, Mr. Chavan has spoken of some of it. And perhaps we can discuss, you know, this session in two halves. One is the city from the point of view of the working classes and the poor, and cities in terms of the rich and the professionals, you know, and how the two must aspire for a sort of common goal. So to begin with, if we stay with the working classes, as Mr. Chavan was saying that his ideal would be if there were working opportunities and housing within a small radius. Uh, is that at all possible in India? Is that thinking happening at all? And again, what would be further characteristics of a human settlement? Well, uh, uh, I couldn't agree with him more uh, that the only solution we have for future is of mixed use. We have actually, India has always been a mixed use country for thousands of years. It's only from the 30s and 40s when we introduced so called scientific planning that we began to segregate things and divide everything into zones and then see them as cast in. Stone. So that attitude has to change, and it is already beginning to change. I think in many states in India, they've already adopted, like Madhya Pradesh, Delhi Master Plan also talks about certain level of mixed use. So mixed use is certainly one way to reduce the kind of commuting that he referred to, people would have to make to work and back. Not only work, to go to institutions, to go to school, everything. So that mix is a very critical factor. But along with the mix, we have to ensure that for it to be a just city, the, there has to be the basis, has to be equity, has to be the basis of planning. And that means basically that we, we should be able to reach amenities and facilities to all the people in the city. And I think, I think uh, till we can house people in reasonably good environments, not just piling them on, on high-rise high buildings, without any amenities, but actually housing them in viable environments, unless we are able to do that, unless we are able to arrive at a just city or a, or a city that can talk about equity, I don't think we, we should be looking at a future uh, for our cities. 
because your fast burning fuse will be in operation if it doesn't happen. No, in fact, two things, Katie. One is that, you know, as you said, <coughs> there's a strange government policy of mm. wanting almost maximum urbanization. And if, I, if I'm correct, I think, you know, we are already at 40 and 50 percent, and the aim is to get 85 percent of India into cities. But the cities are not planning for the people at all. So you're pushing them out of the rural hinterland. The city doesn't want to absorb them. And there's a great degree of social unrest that is building up. Delhi, for instance, has 500,000 people coming in every year. Every year. And I think there's 10 lakh uh, houses missing, you know. So I want to come back to some of that. But David, first, this idea of dreaming cities, I think pretty much, you know, if, if one can speak in generalities, almost all of middle class India dreams of Singapore, Shanghai, Dubai as being the ideal cities for, for India. You do a lot of work in Shanghai. Is it a good city? Is it the ideal human city? Well, I think that Shanghai is actually a very vibrant city. It's one of the most exciting places that we do work. But it has its problems. Uh, one of the things about having a, an authoritarian government is that you can get ahead of uh, urbanization in a way that you can't in a democracy or, a ha or haven't seen governments be able to. Uh, they can build the infrastructure and allow demand to follow as opposed to the challenge of India, which basically is chasing demand and urbanization. And they've been able to accommodate a rate of urbanization that is probably twice the rate of, of India. There's uh, about 20 million people every year moving from uh, rural uh, environments to urban environments, and here it's closer to 10. So uh, by being able to develop a long-term plan and a vision for infrastructure, whether it's transportation or utilities uh, or services, they've been able to accommodate a much rap more rapid rate of urbanization. And I think that's a, a powerful thing. I think uh, Shanghai, in many ways, is one of the most vibrant cities in the world. If you look at uh, the Middle East, it's a very different model. They have no real underlying demographic demand. In, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, and the Gulf states, they're trying to convert uh, an oil economy into a future economy that they envision that won't be based on oil. So they're trying to create uh, different kinds of industries, a knowledge economy, uh, by building infrastructure, schools, uh, financial centers uh, that will hopefully draw talent to them. But they have huge problems with immigration because the local population is extremely constrained and small and can't really accommodate the vision they have. Um, so it, it depends upon the situation, but I think one of the challenges for India is this question of how do they develop a long-term vision for the basic infrastructure required to accommodate the transformation of uh, a, a rural-based economy to a much more urban, urbanized base. And, and right now, I don't think that they're meeting that challenge. I think that's, that's the basic struggle we're facing. Mr. Chauvin, you know uh, what David said, that you need a kind of almost autocratic government to be able to do the kind of planning. Uh, you know, I think New York and Paris, they took the route of bulldozing <coughs> down, uh, you know, the unplanned city and, and, and brought new cities in, in their wake. We can't do that in a democracy. And fascinatingly, in the 12th Commission, opposite to an autocratic way of planning, I think the thing is about making it a participatory planning, putting planning in the hands of the people. Is that a good idea? Is it feasible? Uh, you know, uh, I think you've just come up with a housing plan in Bombay. Uh, how does it work? See, that's the problem. You know, while uh, participatory planning and people-centric planning is always important as a concept, but we face a huge challenge of uh, urban governance, municipal governance. And uh, I would not even say uh, democracy versus a, a more uh, authoritarian regime, I would put our democracy as a more freewheeling democracy. I mean, this, I mean, <laughs> I mean the, and the challenge is there, there are great planners in India. Uh, we can get best in the world. It's not difficult, but how do you implement that? And uh, how do you get over the populist decision-making which the elections and the vote bank politics imposes. For example, in 1997-90, I'm again coming back to Mumbai because that's my experience. I wanted to uh, focus on Mumbai. Yeah, because uh, 
1997, the then government, coalition government in Mumbai, announced a policy for uh, making Mumbai slum-free. That time, there were 8 million people living in slums. Uh, sorry, uh, 0.8 million people, 8 lakh people living in slums. And the government announced that they will give all of them a free house in situ, where they were creating shanty towns or slums. Now, that was a very popular policy, and they thought they could get re-elected. They did not. But it's very difficult for me to reverse that policy. It attracted as a magnet. If you come from any part of this country or outside this country and somehow get into a slum, you're assured to get a free house sooner than later. Today, I have 14.7, one point, almost 1 1.5 million people officially living in slums. Unofficially, people tell me it's much more than that. Now, I can't reverse the decision of giving a free house and same locality where they're located. These are private lands, these are state government-owned lands, there are city government-owned lands, there are central government-owned lands. How do I reverse that decision? The second challenge is, uh, as I said, urban governance. We work in three tiers. There's a national government, there is a state government, which I preside over, and there's a city government. A city government has certain powers, and the state government has certain powers. How do you coordinate? And particularly if you get a city government belonging to a different party than this state government, there is a friction. But I think uh, broad parameters of what is good planning can always be introduced. And uh, if you keep few things, I am particularly concentrating in this large metropolis on three themes, and there are many problems. First is, given the position of Mumbai today, and also given the geography of Mumbai, it's a peninsula are made by connecting seven islands historically. And we have put self-restraint, probably rightly so, of not reclaiming him even a square meter of land. I say rightly, perhaps because it's difficult to control, uh, we did reclaim some land and there were issues there. So now I can't, there is no elbow room at all, like Delhi has, or probably Shanghai has, or probably uh, Calcutta, Chennai has. I have no place to expand at all. So wherever these slums are located, I have to redevelop them into vertical towers. Now, the entire planning has been based on the floor space ratio, or as you call floor space, in, floor space index FSI. And we give more FSI, let people build vertically, then you convert the horizontal slums into vertical slums, and then free up some areas, uh, the value that is locked into that land, one of the most expensive real estate, I think, anywhere in the world, probably comparable to New York and London or wherever. And so the whole planning has been based on pushing people into vertical towers in, in the same location because we had to get them in some location. We cannot relocate them. And then freeing up some land. Then how do you capture the value that is locked into the land? And that has gone wrong in Mumbai. It was all left to market forces, private individuals, and then the people who lived there did not get a fair deal. How do you bring back the state into the picture where the excess value that is locked into the land comes back to the state and the private sector is used only as contractors and building buildings and roads and water works and all that, not as owners of land, which was the you know, pattern which is being followed today. Mr. Chauvin, you said two things which I think are you know, almost radical to hear anybody say now. One is that when planning was left to market forces post-1991, automatically self-interest has pushed maximum urbanization around already existing infrastructure. They are not magnets for other infrastructure, uh, you know, for satellite towns to grow. And number two, what you just said, which is that, again, it's left to market forces. See, Dharavi, you know, 500 acres of land suddenly opened up. And, you know, private developers are not interested in building low-cost housing, you know. Uh, and also the government has been selling that money, uh, that land at 240 rupees a square feet when it will actually have value of 30,000 rupees per square feet. If all of this is to be left to market forces, where is the answer? You know, I mean, where is, is housing going to come from, low-cost housing? I think there are a couple of issues I'd like to correct. 
number one, Dharavi is a large slum, almost 500 acres. But it is not left to market forces at all. It is a land which has been taken over by government. Market forces are, or the private developers are only involved uh, in developing certain sectors. We divided that into five sectors. And we bid out the process of uh, inviting international developers to build various sectors. The process failed. We had to scrap that whole process. And uh, we said, no, we'll do it for the government public uh, housing corporation, which is also a problem. Now, the densification there is so huge that whatever FSI incentives that we are given, that we'll give, allow people to build tall buildings, uh, even then, I don't think whatever illegal migration that has happened into it will be able to locate everybody in the same place. But I will not be able to convince people to move out to area which is four or five kilometers. So we're grappling with the uh, des urban design of that area. Uh, yes, the land value is very expensive. And the, my challenge is how do you bring back the land value to state so that state then can use that money to build huge public housing. Uh, Kitty, I just wanted to ask you just to go back to the Shanghai question that David said that that is one of the most spectacular cities in the world, and I know you heartily disagree with that, you know, so can you tell us why? Why, why do you, and can spectacle, you know, large, massive, towering buildings make the soul of a city? Uh, <coughs> certainly just the spectacle cannot make a soulful city which can uh, accommodate its people, particularly in a country like India. So uh, I've just been to Shanghai three weeks back, and I've seen some of uh, David's buildings also there. Uh, spectacular building. It has a lovely profile. And, uh, but big buildings don't make a city. In India today, you have this uh, two simultaneous processes going on. One is of uh, the corporatization of the city, which is what Shanghai is all about. Basically, it is just investment-driven, large-scale development in which you keep the poor and the countryside people out from the city, and then you just build uh, wonderful spaces, internationally acceptable architecture, and so on, in those spaces. But in India, you have this tension between uh, designing the public place for people and creating the spectacle. It's a reality that we have the corporate sector as a big presence in real estate as well as in our cities. And there has to be a kind of method of uh, providing for that spectacle also to take place. But there is also parallelly the democratization process of planning going on in India. I think in Bombay itself, uh, I think you have sir, just initiated that uh, interaction between the master plan and the people by using NGOs and other uh, the Urban Design Forum, etc., as intermediaries for interacting with the people. So the, the plan is being now taken to the people. Uh, this exercise has been going on in Delhi in a, a somewhat warped way, like many things happen in Delhi. It's uh, also a little kind of twisted, in the sense that you make a plan, which is already a legally binding document, then you take it to the people in Delhi and say that this is what you're going to get. And that's called public participation. Whereas in Bombay now, at least they are taken the master plan to the people. And there is that democratization process which is taking very strong root in India as, a, as part of the planning process. So there is this creative tension between the, the, the corporate image of the city and the public space for people. So I think if we, uh, we see that over 50% of most of our cities, people are living in either illegal settlements or in slums. I think there is an obligation to actually prioritize the housing for them as, and housing and workplaces for them as much as we now currently prioritize the corporate segment. Yeah, because uh, a lot of the Maruti unrest happened because the working conditions of the labor, you know, they live in <coughs> absolutely dismal conditions around a world-class factory and that, that is building up. You know, they are part of the city economy but there's no place in the city for that, them. That is actually the fuse that is already blown. That is already blown. Is yeah. the Maruti factory. And such fuses are plenty in our cities, in different locations. Even in the case of putting people into tall buildings, if you put, house the urban poor into tall buildings, the lift and the lobby space becomes an extremely dangerous thing. It becomes extremely risky for children, women, and old people 
because there is no one to man those spaces, and on top of it, they can't even afford to pay for that electricity. So in some cases, the state has to step in and subsidize that for many years to come. I don't know how many years that subsidy can run, of running the lift and the costs of running it. And the social risk remains all the time for children and women who live there. Besides, people who live in slums are used to a kind of a horizontal social networking. That is completely disrupted when people are piled up on top of each other. And the disadvantage that you have when you build very high for low-income housing, I'm not saying that there should be no tall buildings, but I think housing has to be looked at with a different lens altogether. And uh, we need to look at amenities which are provided for them and the kind of approaches and locations for work and their new, uh, new ways in which they can interact with the growing economies in the city. These have to be designed into housing. Housing is not just about production of houses for people to live in and piling them on top of each other like a box. It's about giving them a living environment. And I think that's a basic obligation in, a, in the democratic system which lies with the state. And I would say that between the alternative of giving free houses to people, like you just suggested, sir, and market, market, marketizing or monetizing the land, there is another alternative of actually planning to make them part of the financial plan. And that attempt has never been made in India. Nobody has tried to develop a financial model in which the person who is going to occupy the house can, in dribbles, pay back the money. And they have the money to do so. It's not that they don't have the money. We don't have the financial instruments to make that happen. And that has not been explored in our planning. And this is one reason the quick fix solution is, like, call a developer, ask him to do, you know, a big multi-story building with, uh, with all the poor housed in it, and you monetize the rest of the land. That's an easy quick fix. But that's really not a solution that's socially sustainable. In fact, uh, Katie, two things. One is that the high-rise debate is a very uh, contentious one, and we should come back to it. But also that perhaps I don't, just as a reporter, I, I don't agree with the fact that the poor cannot pay for their houses or don't want to pay for their houses. I'm saying they can pay. Yeah, because and they want to pay. In Yamuna Pushta, when they were pushed out, almost all the slum dwellers said that they already pay <coughs> to have tenancy, and, but it's temporary tenancy. And they said, we are willing to pay 30,000, 50,000, you know, pay anything Absolutely. to have that piece of land legitimately. But we'll come back to the high-rise debate, Katie. I just wanted to ask you, David, we've talked about cities through the politics of the poor and the working classes and how important it is. <coughs> but what about cities for the well-off and the professionals and the rich? Why is it that Indian cities fail even on that count? You know, we are not cultural centers. We are not centers where, you know, if we, are, if we are historical cities, then we have some culture. But otherwise, we are pretty faceless on that count. So to come back to my question, uh, how do you make cities lively, intellectually lively and vibrant, even for the rich? And number two, from what Katie said about public spaces, in India, in Delhi, you might have the most splendid, spectacular buildings. The parking lot will be a mess. You might have the most spectacular building. The public plaza will be a mess. You know, how, how do architects like yourself uh, get enjoined to make the public space around your spectacular buildings as beautiful? Well, let me, let me say to your point about uh, high-rise public housing, which I agree completely is probably an inappropriate solution in many cases. And the U.S. has tremendous experience with project, projects housing, which have turned into uh, our own kind of dystopic uh, present day uh, situation. But uh, we not only do tall high rises, we're working on the Shanghai Tower, which is the second tallest building in the world, but we also do low rises. I, I just visited in, in Bangalore uh, a world house, which we are doing a project with a, a, a for-profit housing company for the poor, low-cost housing. We've designed and built uh, houses for $1,500 that somebody who makes $100 a month can pay $20 a month to, to own their own house in eight or 10 years. And that's built out of materials that they can participate in that are efficient, and it's designed by them with us to meet their needs, not the, the architect's vision of what 
a building should be for them, but they actually can participate in the design of exactly how they want their rooms split up. And it's empowering them in a different way than, than the typical public housing kind of model. And I think it's something that taps into that incredible vibrancy that you see in the slums, whether it's in Brazil or in Tijuana or in uh, Mumbai or Bangalore, these shanty towns actually have a vibrant life and there's an economy in there that is functioning if you can tap into it. You can actually leverage that vibrancy and create a much more sustainable horizontal community. Um, to your point about uh, you know, uh, institutions that provide culture, I think uh, American cities uh, you know, get it wrong as much as they get it right. And it seems to me that uh, when we get it right, uh, usually there's a community of leaders that tap into the wealth of that community to create uh, institutions that are leading that culture. And, and it's been fascinating for me, I've lived in Los Angeles for the last 20 years, and you'd think with an industry like the entertainment industry that, that we'd have this incredible leadership community that was committed to the, to the, uh, the city of LA and, and built great cultural institutions, but in fact, for many, many years now, that hasn't happened. It's only been recently that people like Eli Broad and some of the other city leaders with significant wealth have started to really invest in the city. And you see LA changing its, 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 uh, its nature from a, an eight-hour city, which was a very dystopic kind of place in the evenings with not very much going on, to much more vibrant uh, environment with an entertainment district and a cultural district and housing is coming back to the city and we're seeing use conversion and historical preservation happening that is starting to create a real livable city in downtown LA which when I arrived 20 years ago was nowhere near happening and it's still probably um, 10 years off but I think it's it's up to city leaders it's up to communities to take responsibility for building their own institutions and and that takes real Commitment that takes commitment from the wealthy in every community. No, but but what about just the aesthetics of a city? You know about tradition. For instance, you work in 160 uh, countries, but we are reduced to having the same kind of city in whichever part of the world you go to. There is just no idiom difference. There's no you know there's no tradition. There's no aesthetics, and it's a I, super I, I mall culture. That, you know, I, and I actually think if you look at Shanghai as an example, when Shanghai. Uh, in, in Pudong was a, was a, a rural uh, uh, area and they planned a financial center, high-rise center. And that has become uh, in many ways a problem because the way they planned it, the policies uh, had setbacks that created these very tall buildings that are islands unto themselves. They're disconnected from the urban fabric. But if you look at the rest of Shanghai, the Shanghai style, which is the juxtaposition of the new and the old, and the preservation of the historic, has taken hold in a way that's exciting. You go to the, the warehouse district where there's art galleries and a vibrant life. You go to the French Quarter where you can see the old buildings and the tree-lined streets. They've luckily, before they destroyed it, they started to recognize the value of what they had and they started to develop plans that preserved it. Now, everything that's old doesn't deserve to be preserved, but that, that historical context and fabric that exists in cities like Mumbai and, and Delhi and around your country and, and in China have become a huge, valuable asset to those communities. It's not about creating a city of you know, hundred story buildings, but you have areas, like in London, they moved Canary Wharf was the area that they identified, an old warehouse. In 1970s, they started it and, and, it, and it went bankrupt even, but it's become this vibrant financial center that f the city can feed off of, but it hasn't ruined the city's historical fabric. Uh, you know, we're running out of time. This is just such a gigantic topic. Uh, sir, I'd just like you to share with us a really difficult decision that you've had to make uh, related to a township project, a city, what were the considerations that went into it, you know, whether in sanctioning a project or in scrapping a project? Can you share with us some inside detail of, you know, just being in government? Yeah. Only basic uh, two themes that I worked on. One was that uh, Mumbai real estate is one of the most expensive real estate in the world. And the value that is locked in the public land or government-owned land even private-owned land, must be recovered and must come back to the state. Secondly, whenever you 
get any public involvement, it must be a transparent bidding process, which it was not. With these two principles, we were able to take many decisions. One other thing was there was a lot of lack of transparency and opaqueness into sanctioning plans. <laughs> uh, a lot of concessions could be given by every officer, and people virtually had to take about 40 different permissions before a building could be sanctioned. There was a huge lot of rent seeking. So we rewrote the building rules, of course, it's not a perfect situation here, which has brought in a level playing field uh, between small builders, large developers, everybody. And I think by and large, it has been welcomed. We're also capturing the excess value, asking people to pay upfront for whatever additional FSI they get. We are the first state to enforce that every large building housing project must have 20% reservation for economically weaker sections. Government will take them over at a market, at a construction cost, no profit, no loss, and then trans hand it over to needy people on a lottery basis. Secondly, we are the first state in the country to have set up a housing regulator for people, private developers who build housing and then allot it to private people. There are a lot of disputes, so we are legislated a regulator. The, my idea of decongesting is we just cannot wish people away. I, had, I don't have land. I have constraints like heritage district and what uh, David talked about. We are also extremely concerned about our heritage areas, which are historically, we are preserving them. You have to go through a committee before you can do any development work, and the committee must certify that the heritage will not be destroyed. I have a great huge problem of coastal regulatory zone where you cannot build anything. Whole lot of areas have gone away. Half of Mumbai is green, the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. So we have green areas, except that I don't have any free land. We have time to take a stock of the, uh, the housing situation, or the slum situation. I've got 37 square kilometers of slums out of which I can build uh, 24 square kilometers could be built because others are not buildable reservations. Now, out of those 24 square kilometers, I had to build public housing in half of them so that rest of the half of it could be used for economic exploitation, which will pay for the 12 square kilometers of uh, housing. My debate now is between architects and town planners, what is the density that I can, that I can allow? How, much, how, rise, how high could be the public housing towers? And the debate between top architects in the country is one architect uh, says that, well, seven should be maximum, ground plus seven. The other architect, equally famous and equally renowned, says, no, you should be able to go to 24, 25 floors. I am scared to know that the lifts will always work, the water will always reach, what happens to old elderly people, points that you mentioned. I just don't have land. Now, short of, um, short of building castles in the air, I don't have land. So where do we, so the only solution for that is you have to build integrated townships outside the, the congested area. So people voluntarily move, you have to create economic activities in those townships where people get jobs there and the jobs, uh, the housing will follow the jobs. And, and that's why I'm just going to announce a new policy for integrated townships. Anybody who can bring 100, uh, 40 hectares of land can build a township provided he builds certain economic area certain social infrastructure, and then housing. We hope that that will decongest the city naturally. I'm worried that we're not able to provide economic activities in the island city of Mumbai. The actually decadal population growth is actually not going up compared to Thane, which is where the decadal population growth is 70% every 10 years. I think we are putting in some policies where uh, we incentivize people to move, request central government to make more land available, and rework the uh, redevelopment schemes that we have got from slab redevelopment. I'm sorry, we, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, there are many, many uh, strands that we haven't followed through. Uh, when I asked you, David, about, uh, you know, tradition and, and idiom, I didn't just mean heritage and modernity, you know, just the two juxtaposition, but that why must every modern building look pretty much the same across the world, you know? Can there not be differences in culture? Uh, that was one thing. The other, Katie, which I know you would have spoken about is of, can we not learn from tradition, you know, in terms of energy conservation and, and, and much of that. Uh, but we'll have to leave it there. I particularly again want to thank Mr. Chavan for at least making a beginning in a conundrum as gigantic as Mumbai, making it in the correct way, giving us signs of hope. Uh, Russo has a wonderful quote. He said, 
Houses make towns. It's citizens that make cities. Let's hope we emerge better citizens from this session. Thank you for listening. Oh, <laughs> my